The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today. My name is Adrian Benjamins, and I'm joined by Coach. And this episode is brought to you by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Taste the Kona difference. Head over to HawaiianIsles.com and Amazon and get some delicious coffee from Hawaii. Coach, how are you doing tonight, sir? Yo, Adrian, I am doing great. How's it going on your side? It's going pretty good, you know. So we were talking briefly before we hit the record button on this show. And, um, you know, other than playoffs, we were talking about how, for the most part, it's been a little quiet in the NBA. But we do got some great playoff basketball to talk about. Uh, Coach, specifically tonight, man, your Sixers are looking fantastic. Big blowout victory here tonight in Toronto what do you think of Philly right now? I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I, I went out on a limb with that pick, and then, you know, d- game one, they just looked so horrible. It was unbelievable. So I was taking a lot of heat. <laughs> but uh, now I'm feeling good. They, You know, it looks like Embiid's feeling better. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a great series like I expected. Um, and it's certainly far from over, but at least I feel like my – my uh, Warriors Sixers final is still a possibility, so I'm excited. Man, about. speaking of Joel Embiid, man, when this guy is healthy, he is one of the best centers in the NBA. Tonight was fantastic, man, blocking shots, uh, doing some spectacular dunks, even hitting threes. I mean, showing a little bit of everything, and uh, it looks great, man. I, w- I thought at the beginning of the series um, – Philly would be the favorite as long as, and like their uh, success would be based on Embiid's health. And he's looking really good, man. And with him looking good, they look unstoppable. I do think Toronto going to come back in the next one and make it close. But as long as Embiid stays healthy, I definitely think Philly's got the edge, man. So it's looking pretty good, looking pretty fun. Any last thoughts on Philly and uh, Toronto? Well, it's, you know, with, with Kawhi on the team for Toronto, I mean, you certainly never can count them out. He's so incredible. But uh, it was you had mentioned about Embiid being one of the better centers. I don't know for, for our hoop ballers that were uh, listening to the broadcast tonight, Mark Jackson had said he felt Embiid was now close to being part of one of the, you know, group of the best NBA centers in the history of the game. And uh, I thought uh, Van Gundy was going to lose his mind. He was like, what? You know, and he was listing off Jabbar and, and, you know, Russell and all down the line. He said, uh, and has got a while to, to get to that point. And you know what? I agree with him. I think with Embiid in, in being, you know, his health always being in question, longevity is, is going to have to, you know, eventually be the, the measuring stick for him really being one of the best centers. But, you know, I'm with you. I think personally, I think he is the best center in the game right now when healthy. And uh, if he can put a group of seasons together like that, then he may, you know, end up in that conversation. Well, you know, I think we should look at this a little closely. You know, since we got some time, um, let's, let's kind of dive a little deeper here. I mean, we said, I think, on the last show that even though we both love Embiid, you know, when you're drafting in that first round, right, um, you don't want to take that risk um, on an injury-prone player. But if we break this thing down, Coach, I mean, maybe what, Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, um, Nikola Jokic, I mean, are those, I mean, those are the only centers that come to mind as guys you would take ahead of Joel Embiid. Do you agree with that, or would you take Embiid sooner than those guys, or is there anyone else that you think I might be missing that should be added into that uh, conversation? What do you think about it? Well, it's, you know, it's going to be a really tough decision for all the owners out there because, you know, I do believe he's the best center in the league, 
would I take him first of the centers overall? Man, I you know I don't know. It's it's gonna it's gonna depend on a multi, multitude of things. I think first of all, you know Anthony Davis. We have to see where he's gonna end up and determine what his usage and you know minutes and all of that are gonna be. Um, so you know that's one intangible. The the uh, Timberwolves. We'll see if they're going to get any high draft picks or who they're going to add to the mix because right now they're just really depleted and uh, really Towns' usage is is almost up there with hardened kind of uh, stuff. So you got to continue to consider him. And then, you know, without question, Jokic has proven in the playoffs here that he's just a monster triple-double machine. I mean, he – he may be the guy to take first as the safest guy. But, uh, you know, if, if some of those things don't, you know, don't work themselves out, then – and Embiid has a good summer and he's, you know, finished up the playoffs well, I still think, you know, it's, a, it, it's something that we'll have to discuss through the summer in preparation for uh, everybody's drafts next year because that is – such a huge pick for everybody. And if you're in that middle to bottom of the first round, that could make or break your season. Yeah, you know, and I love that we're kind of getting this renaissance of the big men. Um, I think so much was said that how, you know, the league, it kind of went to like a guard heavy and a wing, a perimeter game. And now we're kind of seeing that return of the big men, guys like Jokic. And um, you mentioned, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, his usage. Another thing I love about Carl Anthony Towns is a very durable guy. You know, unlike Embiid, um, unlike Anthony Davis, uh, Cat seems like he doesn't miss a lot of games. And, uh, you know, one of the themes go Going into this past season, coach, was uh, how thin we were at center. Like, I think it was the thinnest position in fantasy. And so, for me, in a lot of my drafts, uh, a strategy I had was to lock up centers early. So, I'm kind of glad we're kind of already thinking ahead. Like, hey, early in this draft, what are the centers we like the best? I love these guys that we're talking about. I love your thought about, hey, let's see how things shake out this summer. You know, what are teams going to be doing as far as adding players, adding rookies, free agents, trades? As you mentioned, like the Timberwolves, are they going to like there's so many different factors here. So I can't wait to come back to this again during the summer, explore um, the center position Get your thoughts again on, you know, the guys that you like up at the top. But so far, man, it is looking really good. A lot of stud centers uh, that we're going to be drafting in fantasy. It's a lot of fun, man. Uh, and in closing, oh, so let's let's head back over to the playoffs real quick. And uh, you mentioned that your uh, prophecy of the Warriors and the Sixers. I love it, man. And I want to head over to the Warriors and the Rockets. So two games down, Warriors taking a big lead, uh, 2-0 in this series. Coach, I feel like um, the theme in the second round has, for me has been like, firepower like you know tonight we just saw philly had more firepower tonight with butler and ben simmons and even jj reddick like they just had more guns and i feel like the warriors have outgunned the rockets like um the rockets need harden chris paul capella to have outstanding games where the warriors can win with Um, average games from Curry and Klay Thompson. And, you know, they've got so many different guys that can step up because I feel like they have more firepower. Coach, do you think the Rockets can make a series out of this? Or um, is it going to be more of what we've been seeing, just the Warriors just kind of uh, just outplaying the Rockets? What are your thoughts on this uh, series? Well, you know, I I was looking forward to the series as, as, you know, all of, NBA fans were because it you know it was a rematch of last year when when uh, Paul went down and, and it looked like Houston was going to win the series. But I agree with you. I just I think it's showing very very much so that you know the Warriors have all four All Stars out there and 
you know, Harden getting uh, smacked in the eyes there and, and that, you know, messing him up. And, and you know, let's face it, Chris Paul is, is one of the best point guards of all times, but he's towards the end of his career. And, you know, Capella just seems to not really have his feet about him in this, in this uh, series. And it, it almost goes to what we were saying. You know, if you notice, there were some lineups in, that Golden State has used and then Houston has had to, follow suit where it's actually like four guards and a forward on the floor or three guards and two forwards, all really small lineups, which tends to happen in the playoffs. If you don't have one of those top notch, you know, four or five centers. So, you know, it just, it seems like golden state has their number and that, you know, Houston is just not quite up to snuff with, with the talent level. And uh, you know, I, I would say, I know, you know, Houston at home is, is strong and they're, they're going to make a run. But, you know, I'm, I'm with sort of you and everybody else. It just seems inevitable that the Warriors are just too talented. And I would anticipate that the next round, whether it be Denver or Portland, it's going to pretty much be the mm-hmm. same thing. It's going to be, you know, maybe Jokic against all of them and it's going to be, uh, you know, Dame against all of them. But they just got too many too many weapons yeah, man. i agree with you 100 percent, man like it feels like it's two against five when you're watching the rockets and the warriors and one of the things that really surprises me about the warriors is how they take uh they've taken clint capella like completely out of this series uh i think in that first game capella took two shots had a much better second game but you know so much of what the warriors do is out on the perimeter and so because of that it's like they take that big man factor really out of the equation and um you know when the rockets are playing an average team during the regular season clint capella his presence is huge, what he does down low, what he does on defense. But you see a series like this, how uh, there's times I forget that he's even out there on the court. And so um, that's really surprising. But coach, I love what you said uh, about, you know, even if Houston does make a series that let's say they just win another game or two, it just feels like, uh, uh, you know, the Warriors are going to win this one. And even looking ahead to the next series, you know, Let's go ahead and move over to Denver and Portland. That series is tied up. Um, I agree with you, man. I just feel like whatever team comes out of this series, it's like the same thing. They don't have the guns and firepower to match up against the Warriors. A lot of probably what we're seeing in Houston where, you know, it's Dame and CJ versus, you know, four four guys over in, uh, over in uh, Golden State. So, uh, but... If you did have to pick a team here, uh, Denver, Portland, who do you like? Series is tied up. We've seen a great game from Denver. Portland bounces back in game two, plays a good game. Who do you like here? Wow, man, that it is just razor close as far as I think it's just totally up for grabs. Mm-hmm. I really do. I mean, it's, you know, Portland did get the split in Denver. So, you, you know, they've got the home court back to them. So I'd give them a slight edge. I still, you know, think Denver's Denver doesn't have a ton of experience, and San Antonio pushed them to the limit, and maybe they're going to start feeling that a little bit. So I think Portland has a slight edge, but it wouldn't surprise me if it went either way. But I, I want to mention one thing about the Warriors, too. I think that the biggest difference in them in the last couple of months is Dream mm-hmm. on Green. He, he started out just – really terrible the the first half of the year. And I guess he recommitted himself sort of after uh, that big blowout between him and and KD when, you know, he told KD they didn't, you know, what need him and et cetera. But uh, he, I guess what I read was he sort of recommitted himself, got in the gym and between uh, the all-star break and now he lost 20 pounds and he's, uh, and you can see it out on the floor. He is just, he's the one that's taking Capella out of the game and just creating that intangible that, that sets the Warriors up to the next level. So, you know, uh, I thought there would be a little bit of vulnerability there with Cousins down, but with Draymond back to his top-notch form, 
you know, they're, they're right back, uh, you know, to being t- t- by far the team to beat. Plus from Draymond's standpoint, it also, you know, I had pushed him way down my draft board for next year. Uh, but you know, this, this makes you look mm-hmm. again, you know, is, is this the guy that can throw some triple doubles on the board and, and still have some decent fantasy value. So, so coach, I I saw that same report, and you know, to me, it made me cringe a little bit. And I want to get your thoughts on this. I mean, why can't the guy do what he needs to do in the off season? Get in shape. Get your body right. Why did he have to wait for like the All Star break or the midway point? I mean, it seems to me that maybe. Uh, Draymond or the Warriors in general, maybe they're kind of over, or they're not. Um, they're not so worried about the regular season or their seeding, right? They had a year a couple seasons ago where they were the number one seed and um, killed themselves to be the number one seed and kind of didn't really matter too much. So, to me, you know, when I saw that report about Draymond, um, not really being ready at the beginning of the season, but more towards the middle of, of the season, committing himself, uh, getting in better shape, as you said, losing weight. I mean, do you think that's okay? Do you think, um, do you think it's okay to have that mindset or should he be ready? Should he be taking care of that stuff in the off season, preseason, be ready to go on day one of the NBA season? What do you think about that? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Draymond Green fan. I mean, I, I know that, you know, he, he can be a, f- a phenomenal player across the board, offense, defense, spe- specifically defense and just being the glue guy that makes everything work. But yeah, I think he's a bit of a head case, to be honest with you. I think that he's just, you know, he seems obviously the kind of guy that can lose focus with, you know, with all the technicals he gets and some of his reactions so, yeah, no, I mean, I, if I'm the Golden State brass, you know, uh, at, at the end of the season when it's all over, I say, hey, you know, thank you for stepping up. Thank you for doing that. But how about we never put yourself in that situation again? You know, I mean, those guys are making $100 million bucks to, to stay in shape and play, and you only have a certain window of your career where you can produce like that. And to let, you know, to, to step back and let – you know, let yourself go a little bit during that uh, time frame is inexcusable. So, you know, hopefully it's something that they learn from it, but uh, it is troubling. But, you know, he's, you're going to get, there's certain players like him that you're just, you're going to have to accept some of the stuff surrounding him because they're just, uh, you know, interesting guys for sure. And I agree with you. You know, we are so much alike, man. I, so I had Draymond Green on a bunch of my fantasy teams, not this season, but the season before. And uh, I, I would get really disappointed, man, because there are nights when the big three are rolling, when Steph and Clay Thompson and KD, when they're humming along, there's times where Draymond really takes a back seat, you know, where he ends up with like six points and four rebounds and two assists. There's there's nights that he puts up some really low end lines because he's just not involved in the offense and, you know, he's just not engaged on some nights. And so, uh, you know, where he, you needed to draft him this year, I mean, I saw him going as high as like the second round. For me, it was just like, there's no possible way I want to touch this guy right there when I can get an alpha, right? When I can get a guy who's the number one option on their team who could score 30 points um, a night. You know, when guys like that are still on the board, it's really hard for me to go for Draymond. And coach, I like you and pegging him down um, quite a bit uh, on my board for this upcoming uh, draft for next season. Um, you know, I still do love his defense and, you know, we know blocks, uh, steals blocks. Those are very important stats. Some of the hardest stats to get in fantasy. So I do still think he is a useful player in fantasy, but I do kind of feel like, um, he gets looked at more like at, he's really overrated when it comes to fantasy. Like people really value him a lot higher than his actual value is. Uh, would you, would you, agree with that? 
Oh, I, I mean, I, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, I think people still hear him and think, okay, this is a triple gu- double guy that is on a great team, and he's definitely overvalued. However, what again, like we we talked about earlier, this off season is going to be mm-hmm. massive, and it, for for guys like that, because you know, I don't anticipate that Cousins is going to go back, and I personally believe that Durant's mm-hmm. going to go. So if if that happens and they do, you know, and they're with with Curry, Draymond and Clay being the nucleus again, now you're talking about him moving back up my draft board a little bit because, you know, that usage is going to is going to come up. So again, that's going to be a key factor. You know, I had him down literally down to like 6th round uh, on my draft board, uh, but that changes if if those those guys leave the team. Uh, but you know that's again that's why you know we we mention on every show is I know you know the the dog days of 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 some of these shows are are off season, but they are super important because if you you know if, if you have a guy you know or you're looking at a guy or you're you're coming up with your draft strategies for next year you got to keep all these things in mind because every single one of these things we're discussing as free agents and draft and everything goes on throughout the summer, it's going to totally change your, your board. And you need to be prepared for that on the front side rather than reactive as you're trying to get ready, ready for your draft at the very end. Man, I love that take. I completely did not even think about, um, the chance of Cousins being gone, KD being gone, that would definitely improve uh, the usage um, of Draymond Green. And, yeah, I mean, I, I love that take, Coach. Thank you for reminding me that, you know, so much can change this offseason. And uh, I can't wait till we see kind of what what goes down so we can take a closer look at these teams. Um, I can't wait to get into that deeper with you in the offseason, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, one more series to talk about. And uh, this one, I really want to get your take on this one because this one, you know, another series that's tied 1-1. And what's really difficult about this one for me, Coach, is that we've seen like two blowouts. The Celtics getting the victory in game one. Um blowing out the Bucks and the Bucks doing the reverse in game two, blowing out the Celtics. Now the Celtics stealing home court advantage by winning that game one. I personally still believe that the Bucks are going to take this, uh, but I do think it's going to go down to a, a game six, game seven and be a really close series. I want to get your thoughts on this series coach. Who do you like? Well, I, I was, thinking Milwaukee would storm right through them, you know, in four or five. Um, And that first game just shocked me. I, you know, I I think Milwaukee was just sort of expecting to go out there and, and, and knock through them and took it for granted. So we'll see. They certainly look like they woke up uh, in this last game. I think they're the much better team. Um, But, you know, it's, uh, like you said, I think it'll definitely go maybe six or seven, and uh, but I still think Milwaukee's got yeah, the edge. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and um, yeah, I, I just think Milwaukee. Um, they just, uh, I mean, I, you know, I've been talking about firepower, and the Celtics do got a lot. Of, they do have a lot of firepower as well. Very deep team, so on paper they are very even but i just feel like milwaukee's played better during the season and they just looked sharper they look like as a team they're just a little more together so that's why i'm giving them the edge um but man this one if the celtics come together and if they really uh play as a unit uh, kind of like what we saw last year I mean, they definitely could pull this thing out as well it's man it is going to be really exciting these all four of these um, series that we've been talking about, man, playoffs have been so great this year, Coach. It's been so much fun. Yeah. It has been terrific. I think, you know, one thing to mention about Milwaukee and also something, to, to, you know, uh, for, for uh, our Roto uh, guys out there to, to keep an eye on is, is Brogdon. He was supposed to be back in uh, game three, and now they've said that he's probably not going to play. So, 
you know, that'll be a key factor. I think they're going to definitely need him in this next round, whether it be against Toronto or Philly, you know, cause he's a, he's a very integral part of their whole offense and defensive scheme. So uh, hopefully he gets back in there and that's, you know, another guy that's really a, a, an interesting uh, guy for, for where do you put him on your draft board? You know, I think as the season went on and he, he got those additional minutes alongside blood. So uh, his value really uh, raised up and he's consistent as all get out. So hopefully he'll be back uh, and we get, get a good look at him in the, in a playoff run uh, prior to. Yeah. You know, I'm hearing we could see him as soon as game four of this series. So I love your take Uh, Brogdon, you know, coach, I shied away from Brogdon in drafts this year because I just thought that uh, Milwaukee was just too deep with um, Middleton and with Bledsoe and Giannis. I just, you know, I, I didn't realize that the Bucks could, um, that they could have four or five guys and could consistently, that could consistently have fantasy value. And I got to say, man, Brogdon and the Bucks proved me wrong. Brogdon was a solid fantasy asset all year long, consistent. And, um, you know, I talked about, I think on the last show, how one of the reasons why I think Coach Bud is Coach of the Year, Fantasy Coach of the Year, is because I was surprised each and every night when I would look at the Bucks box score, seeing five guys have fantasy value when there's other teams where uh, that can barely that barely have two guys that you can rely on. So, um, man, I love your take on Brogdon. He is on my radar for next year. You know, um, as maybe that third point guard or, you know, that second or third, probably more like that third point guard uh, for your team. Uh, you definitely don't want him to be your primary point guard, but um, I'll start looking at him in those later rounds, hoping he's there. Um, and, and you and Adrian, you bring up a great point there. And I'll tell you, it's and, and again, this is one of the key factors that I hope our hoop ballers pick up on, on some of these shows is, you know, I was lucky enough to have Brogdon on one of my uh, championship teams this year. And the reason that I took him in the draft, it was a huge steal where I got him. I mean, I got him mid draft because I think everybody felt like you did. He's going to get lost in the shuffle and his numbers aren't going to be there, but just, and, and again, this is, this is part of your preparation stuff is knowing coach Bud and how he coaches his rotations. If you remember in his heyday in Atlanta, those guys, everybody on on that first six or seven were huge parts of that team. The Horford and Millsap and all those guys, uh, they all, you know, worked together and they had the best uh, record in the in the East there a couple of seasons. And his that's you know that's what he does. He spreads it around and doesn't make it all fall on the shoulders of one guy. And I think that's really the key factor it's taken uh, Giannis to the MVP level now is that that he knows that he doesn't have to carry the entire team. And it it seems like when you free a guy up like that and he doesn't feel that he has to carry it, that's when he plays his best ball. And he knows he's got Bledsoe and Middleton and and he knows coach Bud is going to sit him in that rotation and get, you know, keep him fresh. And I'll tell you, that's the key thing to look at with these coaches, you know, in the places they're at. Like, for example, Luke Walton in Sacramento, you'll see a big change in their rotation. He goes a little mm-hmm. deeper uh, and, you know, you may not get the the big, big minutes for Fox or, or guys like that. So stuff to look at, but definitely something to factor in because that, again, is going to have a big impact on these guys with their actual performance. Yeah, you know, interesting stuff there, man. Uh, Really great take. You know, a lot of people, they don't think about um, who's coaching these teams. And I think that's great because we've seen the opposite too, right, Coach? We've seen, like, fantasy killers in the past. Uh, I'm trying to think who comes to mind. I can't think of one right now. I I can tell you last season, Malone at Denver was was like that. He literally played. You know, that's when Wilson Chandler and all those guys were there, and he was playing nine mm-hmm. or ten guys pretty, you know, 27, 28 minutes. Even Jokic, you know, he hadn't really 
broken out to the point where he is now. And, you know, you, you just couldn't take any of those guys. One night it was Gary Harris. One night it was Will Barton. One night it was – so it was there was no mm-hmm. consistency whatsoever. So you're going to get coaches like that that go super deep. And I'm telling you, guys like uh, Coach Walton at, at uh, Sacramento are guys like that. They believe in deep rotations and, you know, saving guys to the end. So you got to – you got to keep an eye on that because that's going to affect, especially if you have somebody in a new position like that. It's, it, it really affects things going forward because it immediately – I have De'Aaron Fox in the keeper league, and when he was hired there, I, I like Coach Walton, but I thought, man, you know, this, I, I guarantee you he's going to lose about five minutes a game, which is big fantasy mm-hmm. points. So, you know, something to keep an eye on in your, in your uh, you know. Yeah, and, you know, on the flip side to that, I always uh, – add a little bit of value to your Minnesota Timberwolves because Coach Tibbs, uh, or at that time, Coach Tibbs loved to ride his guys for like, I mean, you could count on uh, Wolves players to get like an extra five minutes a game. It was ridiculous. So, yeah, or, or more than that. Yeah. So anyways, it's, you know, I think that would be a great topic for a show, right? Like coaches to target, coaches to uh, to avoid. Maybe that's something we'll look at uh, exploring more over the summer. All right, Coach. Uh, hey, somehow we talked over 30 minutes just talking playoffs, man. Um, we pretty we pretty much covered playoffs, went over every series so far. Looking forward to talking more next week, seeing what's shaked out, how things are um, looking after another week. Um, anything else you think we need to cover as far as like rumors or fantasy news or anything like that well we're we're uh just under two weeks from the uh lotto for the for the draft so that'll be a big topic for us to look at in a couple of weeks because that'll start shuffling the deck of you know figuring out where zion gonna go you know uh how how are these things gonna shake out so you know that will be a lot of fun um so and and then I I got my final uh, tickets for NBA Summer League in Vegas. So my son and I will be there for 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 the days. I hope yes. to see you there. Maybe we can do a podcast right there and uh, see if we can get Skeets or one of the starters guys to say hello. Oh, to that the would podcast. that would be outstanding, man. That would be fabulous. <laughs> and man, you are you are ahead of the game, my friend. Uh, I I haven't even thought about getting tickets yet, man. I'm I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling like I got to get on the ball here, Coach. I mean, there's no off season, man. My my assistant coaches used to kill me because we had come off a state championship, and uh, on on the bus ride home, I was having those guys get things organized for our summer off season program. They said. Dude, enjoy it for a day. I said, no, man, that's because that's that's what happens. You, you rest on your laurel. Same thing with fantasy. You, you, if you got a championship or finished well this year and you think you're all that, go ahead and take the summer off and see what happens next year. So, you know, stay with it and keep it going, and, and we'll try to keep you as informed as possible, and and, uh, and we'll take it from there, man. we got to get us some, some more championships in the in – I the- love it. Hey – Our main focus, our main drive, the main reason why we are here is to prepare you guys for next season. Now, uh, I would love just to dive right into like team by team prep. But as we mentioned earlier, still so much can go down between free agents and trades. Um, The draft, I can't wait to talk draft with you. I can't wait for the lottery to, like you said, when we get a better idea, where's Zion go? I mean, he could completely change the landscape of a team he is going to be a high usage alpha type player i mean you put a guy like that in cleveland or new york or phoenix and it can really affect uh with the fantasy landscape of a team. So a lot to talk about when that lottery goes down. I, myself, man, I get geeked over the lottery and the draft. Uh, I love that time. The real draft, like the real NBA draft. It's one of the funnest times of the year. So, so much for us to go over coach. So much for us to talk about. Um, Let's put a bow on the show. Where can everybody reach you at? I am uh, on Twitter at, at Joe Sarvati. That's J O E S A R V A D I. 
And, uh, you know, again, the forums have slowed down a little bit on our hoop ball, uh, uh, website, but, you know, still jump in there. If you have any questions, I check it daily and, uh, look forward to just getting on these podcasts and, and continuing. Uh, if you have questions that you want us to bring up on the show, uh, feel free to send them to my Twitter or to yours. What, what is your, um, I am, I am awesome. at Adrian Benjamins and, uh, coach great. I did I completely far. I completely forgot about that. You guys send us your questions. You know, it would be a lot of fun to end each show just doing listener questions. We could do 10, 15 minutes at the end of the show just doing that. So you guys hit us up with your questions. Hit us up on Twitter. We would love to hear from you guys. Uh, thanks again for listening and for supporting the show. And I'm excited for next week. Coach, thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.